Welcome to the Life Coaching with Ryan podcast, episode 9. So this series of podcasts is going to be a little bit different. The theme of the month is the wrongness of death, which was inspired by a conversation I had with my first guest, Chris. Because of Chris's job, he actually is asked not to have his picture shown or his first or his full name rather given and so in order to honor that uh, if you watch this on YouTube you will see a waveform as opposed to uh, our faces and then later in the month I extended the conversation with my friend Jenny who you met in my first series of podcasts uh, words 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 so in that case there will be some video there uh, today we start our conversation Chris and myself talking about his experience with his father's death and the impact on himself and his mother. Enjoy. No problem at all. Cool. Let's do this thing. Let's say let the awkwardness begin. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So. <laughs> Did you hear that? That was my blood pressure going up. <laughs> Heart palpitation starting, right? Affect kicking in, like you said. So, um, topic of the day is the wrongness of death. Uh, I thought of this topic because of a conversation with my guest. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, specifically, that in our culture, there seems to be a disconnect with death. Death is other. Death is evil. Um, and so we try to keep it at bay. There's a constant fear of mortality that is a component, an underlying component of our media and our daily lives. And I think that... Uh, the conversation that we had uh, was very valuable to me as someone who lives with a fear of mortality in my waking, not quite daily life, but um, but it's there, it's present, and when I listen for it, it's there. So I would like to introduce my guest, Chris. Hi. <laughs> so I'm a longtime friend of Ryan's. I think we've known each other for about 15 years. Well before our friends were married, they just yes. had their like eight year anniversary. Right? Yeah. So, wow. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, my name's Chris. Uh, I have a graduate degree in health sciences, but the probably of the many things that I've done in my life, I think uh, the the most relevant one is uh, clinical anatomy that I do. So I do uh, have done cadaver, cadaver dissection, but now mostly I work in imaging sciences, working with MRI, X-ray, CT with the diagnosis. But mm -hmm. but a significant component of what I have done in the past is work with dead bodies, right? So I think that's <laughs> part of part of the relevance uh, yeah. for this group. Um, and I work for a fairly large uh, healthcare consortium. And most recently, uh, in fact, it's been the one year anniversary. Uh, my dad passed on March 22nd of last year. And so uh, I think that maybe without putting a glossing it over, the, the time has given a, a nice little patina to it, um, but also it's still. I won't say raw enough, but it's still fresh enough that there's there's true emotion there, you know, and I'm yeah. still unpacking a lot of what happened. And so this is actually for me and unbeknownst to you, no pressure to you, <laughs> this is this actually represents is probably I mean, this isn't part of any ritual or anything that I'm doing, but it's it's a healthy it feels like a comfortable like, yeah, this is an appropriate time to be talking about it. Awesome. I mean, since my wife is probably who is absolutely wonderful and helped me through the process of my father's death. Um, but I'm sure she's very happy that I'm talking to somebody else about this. <laughs> so you. Well, actually, you know, that, I think that's a good segue just into how we ended up getting on this topic at all, because of, of all the places to have this conversation. We did it at a birthday party at a Dave & Buster's. <laughs> right, at a bar, right? <laughs> right, right, right. We're, right, we're right. at a friend's birthday party. And I'd, 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 I'd like to say that it was like after two or three drinks that I kind of busted into this emotional thing and Ryan was... But it, that's not the way Ryan and I work. You know, no. it was like, hey, dude, okay, you're doing well, I'm doing well. What's the most deepest emotional thing you can think of? Let's <laughs> let's talk about it. Let's, you know? let's jump into that. Okay, yeah, okay, work, okay, transitions in life. Okay, right. oh, by the way, this thing happened to me. Really? 
tell me about? Right, and and I think the way it started was um, you said, "Hey, how's it going?" And I think you had even asked about my parents, as mm-hmm. we do socially in the society. Like, "Hey, your wife's here; she must be good. Your kids are okay. Great. You know, how are your parents?" And I had mentioned, you know, "Hey, my father had passed." Mm-hmm. Um, and at that point, I think it was that this was in May, and it was still very raw for me, and me, you being a very. Uh, Sure, open and nurturing person. I was like, okay, well, here you go, Ryan. <laughs> and I think you were like, wow, man, that's pretty pretty intense. Can I have a bartender? Two more, two more whatever he's having. Actually, you, you, and you already know this, but I, it's it's like, how, how do I phrase this? I am so, flattered is the wrong word, but I'm so appreciative of people's vulnerability. Mm-hmm. As long as they're not bleeding all over me, right. because that's a real thing that people do emotionally, right, 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 right. which sometimes I can be there for that, but I kind of right. need some prep before that happens. Right, right. But this wasn't, that wasn't what we did. You were just present, open, vulnerable. Right. And for me, I just, I snap in. I'm like, I'm here. I'm right. here. So there's right, no right. drink necessary. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, what always blows me away when we talk and why I so wanted to have you as a guest is your immense intellectual capacity while simultaneously maintaining a spiritual presence and awareness. And so the nature of that talk, I mean, I don't know what my face looked like, but if I had to picture my face internally, my eyeballs were constantly bugging out of my head. And (laughs) I had this, like, sense of anticipation where I was just sitting there like what's he going to say next? Well, that's, that's really that's really great because as I told you before I had a little trepidation about doing this podcast not because I don't want to express myself or anything but just right, like right. really this is my personal experience is anybody going to find this relevant you know and right. that's that intro right there that you gave was plenty to make me feel like okay well maybe I have something of value to contribute to this conversation <laughs> that, that being said I want to say I don't have a, I haven't done a deep amount of research into the sociology or psychology of death and bereaving other than what I was uh, placed into at in preparing for and after my father's death. So I'm not a lifelong expert and there are. So I want to caveat everything that I say today that yeah. it was it was my impression, my perception and I recognize that <laughs> despite what some people in my life would say, I am not the center of the universe nor do I know everything about it. So it's really just my perception. Yeah. Take or discard as needed. Yeah. Be gentle in your comments. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the, that's the audience who will be commenting on your blog or, or whatever. Totally. Don't yeah. tweet at me. <laughs> don't, don't, don't at me, man. Don't right. at me, bro. Exactly. Oh, uh, get out of my mentions. Uh, it's it's funny because uh, I said on my last interview podcast, there, there was a point when I said, this is not advice. This is my experience. And one other time that I said something to the effect of, um, Oh, what did I say? Uh, I'm not an expert in this, but I want to be able to talk about it. Right. And I think that there there's, should be a general accepted caveat when anyone is listening to anyone speak, no matter their credentials or supposed expertise, that this is still one person's opinion. It may be an expert opinion, and that maybe should be weighted well above anyone else's opinion in that regard. Um but We're still talking about fallible human beings. Exactly, right? exactly. And there's interpretation, the limitations of language and everything else, um, misunderstandings, misappropriation of ideas. Like, there's a wide range of things. So um, I hope that what we talk about here will be valuable to someone. I know it was certainly valuable to me, uh, and which is why I got so excited about it. Right. When I went through, was making my list of what do I want my themes to be, because of our conversation, I was like, it doesn't matter if I already have 12, that's going to be number 13. Yeah, and then, right, 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 you know, right. that, I, yeah, I, anyway, moving on. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> we'll gush more later. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of, so they had kind of the detail of, okay, random party, as you said, get the barp and, burp and fart jokes out of the way, um, right. and then get serious. Um, but, Maybe just like a couple minute summary of kind of what happened. Sure. And then we can get into details. After sure. That. So um, it was a confluence of things, and it's hard to sort of unbraid one thread from another. But my father uh, was diagnosed almost six and a half years ago um, 
just after my first daughter, so my daughter's seven now, so six and a half, she, he was diagnosed with uh, renal cell carcinoma. And I had also been very estranged from him from, in my opinion, uh, of course, everybody has this opinion about their childhood, you know, <laughs> like things that had gone not right. And I and that this podcast is not about that, but there was some estrangement there. Um, and and then it also around the same time, it became very clear that my mother had uh, had the beginnings of dementia, which is a whole different conversation as well. Right. So yeah. that's a third third uh We'll thing do a to series. unpack, right? <laughs> but but originally, um, what what had happened was my father had sort of an existential crisis at, at when he got his diagnosis, and it led me into a path of reconciliation with him. But and but a reconciliation where I was like, I ain't taking any more of your crap, old man. You know, so it had, we had some very honest conversations and conversations that I necessarily wouldn't have had uh, had I not had this sort of veil of if, if my dad was not off the pedestal. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And and really one of the conversations was like, OK, so you're dying. What's the end of your life look like? Which sounds like a very easy cut and dry conversation or thing to say, but in not reality, even remotely. Really, not well, even. I don't know for my family, but it was. <laughs> when you said when you said that to me, we're, we're you know we're sitting we're talking at a bar, and you're like, yeah. So I asked him, and I was like, holy shit, you did what? <laughs> yeah, and I highly recommend it. When like when somebody and and I I highly recommend it, even for somebody who you don't get along with or you don't particularly like as a family member, because whether you like them or not, society is going to expect you to pick up the pieces when they're gone. Yeah. Right? Like, even if you're like, this so-and-so, and both, by the way, I have a deep love for both my parents. There was, a, we've reconciled. But even if the person you absolutely dislike, society is still going to be like, oh, your father died, I'm sorry, or your mother passed, or whatever. Mm. They're going to expect you to step up to the plate and deal yeah. with these sorts of things as the next of kin, possibly. Yeah. Uh, and so it's really important to have these conversations. So I really was like, so you're terminal. This could be two months, six months. And by the way, at the time of his diagnosis, renal cell carcinoma had a natural course of about six months, right? Yeah, I was so looking we at my were, notes from our conversation. <laughs> so we were really prepared. Yeah. And so there was this sense of urgency where I didn't want to have this conversation with him, but I was like, it's going to happen quickly. And I, so I said, well, what does the end of life look like, dad? And he, he says, you know, I really want to die at, at home. And I said, oh, cool. And you're like, okay, that's great. And then really, I, I thought, you know, let, what is home? There's assumptions. Let's talk about verbiage of what home means. And I, I said, so, so does home mean here in, the, the town that you, uh, Cupertino, the mm-hmm. town that I grew up in that you've been living in, or does home mean where I am and mom is and your grandkids are? Mm-hmm. Or does home mean um, where your stuff is? And, I, and that sounds so like, you know, it's not fashionable to be into your material things, right? Like it's so, but, but like but maybe... But the question is profoundly right, valuable. Like is, is your stuff, because... I, and I started thinking about them myself. There's stuff that I really want around me when I'm. Uh, there are books. Yeah. There are objects of art that I uh, I want around me. And even the bed that you you've lived in, had your children in. You know, I mean, if if that's, but that maybe you want those objects around you, right? Yeah. So home is home where you put your stuff. Who's in there? And we like to be very sort of frou-frou and say, home is where the people I love are. But yeah, I don't know, man. Like, they're a Motel 6, time. I was going to say, a Motel 6, where my family is, is not home, yeah. right? Like, so yeah. So what we actually did is, um, and the other thing I want to say is, he, he said, I want, he expressed to me that the thing that he wanted, home, was where his family was. Right, mm-hmm. and I and so that led into a harder conversation of hey, you got to move out of this house then because we're not moving to you. Right. You got to move to us, mm-hmm. and he was at at the same time incredibly rational about that. He's like, 
I get it. Let's make this work. Let's find a way to do this. And on the other hand, when push came to shove for him to actually move and downsize his life and sell his stuff, I, I want to say the, the highest, one of the highest IQ individuals I had ever met, and then you suddenly see this person decompensate mentally about, like, moving. It was really difficult. You know, and it's funny because then, you know, I got, I felt like, okay, I understand, at least for today, knowing that his answer may change, what you want. So I turned to my mom, who was at the beginning stages of dementia, and I said, hey, mom, what is the end of life for you look like and and, she, and my dad was like well she thinks blah blah and I was like and this is where it was really beneficial that like he was off he had fallen from the pedestal a while ago and I was really <laughs> not putting up with his crap anymore <laughs> and I was like I heard what you had to say dad tell me what mom you know and and by end of death you mean what does your father's end of death, death look, look like, like for your mom, mom. right so right. not like in. her end of death right right like, end of what life, do you rather, yeah. right right um what what does her presence of life look like how will she continue on right. how will she mourn how will she you know and yeah, what's so funny about my mom is whereas my dad had all these opinions about, you know, and this and this, and I could I, I could play with him or prompt him, and he would give me, and, you know, it was really great. Mm. My mom was sort of this collective shrug, right? <laughs> like, and I can't, I can't do the motion because it's a podcast, but it was just <laughs> this sort of, like, eyes rolling up to the corner, you know, and there's sh- sort Force of a the shrug, ears. you know, an extended shrug with the hands up, yeah. you know, sort of. Yeah. And, and what I realized was, though, it became clear to me that my mom wouldn't be able to manage my father's passing, right? Mm. Like, after a while, like, not only intellectually was she down the road of dementia, and I didn't know how fast that was going to progress, but also she um, she just wasn't thinking about it. Like, she wasn't, yeah. like, what does that look like? How am I going to... And that's totally okay, and there are places and times at which people need to, and it wasn't my job to confront my mom yeah. <laughs> with, like, he's going to die! What are you going to do about it? You know, yeah. and that doesn't, that doesn't, that didn't work in that situation. Right. And I felt like, okay, this is something I can take on. And again, I want to share that, like, my experience was not what everyone's will be. I, there's no expectation that I say, you know, everyone should take on and have this conversation with their parents or everyone should 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 take on and manage somebody else's passing. I mean, it was incredibly rewarding for me and validating. And my father got exactly what he wanted, which which great, brought him great joy. And my mom was at peace about it. But I don't expect that everybody's going to be like... Right. Like, especially since death happens sometimes very quickly and traumatically, and you're not prepared for it, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Which goes to part of the common language. When you named this podcast, and you named this podcast for a reason, yeah. but my take on why you named this podcast The Wrongness of Death is that in and of itself, death is not wrong. It's a thing that's going to happen. It's that we are doing death wrong, which sounds so <laughs> has so much hubris, you know, wrapped in it. Sure. But, but the idea is that, like, we could be managing this process better. You yeah. know, we could be... or in, in, And in the case where you're not given the benefit of time to manage the process, we could at least have tools in our toolbox. And for me, one of the biggest one is common language, mm-hmm. like, around this. Interesting. Right? Like... The um, practices in Judaism and Hindu and many other uh, Catholic faiths, uh, of which I should say I'm Episcopalian, uh, Catholic light, but, <laughs> but, but many other faiths have these really great rituals around death, but there's little about like up, coming up to it, you know? Right. And, and they do have some. But what's also really sort of difficult is I am a North American mutt, right? I have classic European and sub, you know, and a little sub-Saharan African, you know, Mediterranean mix in there. But I grew up in the United States and my parents are like second, third generation U.S. citizens, right? Right. And so as a North American mutt, there's very little cultural longevity there and we need Mm. to have a common language. And one of the things that I encountered with you is you were like, hey, how are your parents? I was like, well, my dad's dead. And there's no like, like that is that is the functional equivalent of a social punch in the face. When somebody's like, hey, dude, we're here at a bar. How's it going, man? How are your parents? When my dad died, you're like, do, 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 Debbie Downer. Yeah. You know, you're like, so how do you express that where you, 
I feel like we need a common language because you, Ryan, were not the first nor the last person that I had to disclose that to. Yeah. Like, for example, one of my... Apparently, when you get into your 70s, you have a lot of lifelong friends, right? Some of whom I didn't know about but would call or write letters. Mm. And because of my mom's dementia, she wasn't writing back. So I get a lot of calls like, hey, where's your dad? I'd be like, he passed. I'm sorry. And then there's this, like, they missed the ritual closing of a funeral right, right? and there's right. it was really right. it was really um it was really sort of traumatic for them and i'm trying to think god i wish i had and and i didn't want a script because i every time you tell somebody it needs to be authentic you can't be like sure. so insert name here i understand that you were a close friend of my father you know that doesn't work right, right. right. so how do you be authentic I mean, we just as a culture need better skill, and I don't even know if it's language. Well, I think, but no, that's a really strong point, because frankly, I hadn't thought about this in our first conversation, but it's just become very present for me just now. Um, I had uh, an experience where I had a coworker who was, um, had a resurgence of cancer, and she had to step away from the job. And so that left me, she stepped away the week of parent teacher conferences. Right. Right. And so it was down to me to tell every single family for two solid days, eight, right. nine in the morning to three in the afternoon straight, over and over and over. Right. My coworker has cancer. And she will be absent for the rest of, or for indefinite, it, right? for an un, unknown period of time. And that, and, and that was crushing to me. I mean, granted, it was over forty-eight hours. So, I mean, that is very but intense. But there's this repeated, I, and you go through this process of like, you tell somebody, and you're like, "Wow, that wasn't as emotionally as hard." Am I getting callous? And then you do this deep personal reflection of you're like, "Wait, where am I?" And like, exactly. Like, Just take a deep breath. Don't go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> you know. But but you also bring up a really good point of something that said like, when somebody dies or passes. Whatever language we and see that's we don't even have a collective we don't. word. We don't. You know, when somebody passes um, or transitions, which I always thought uh, the word transition, I always thought that was such a great word. But if you always believe in felt, an afterlife, right, well, a tra- <laughs> they're transitioning. They're not living, right? That's so true. that's true. But, but the, I thought it was a great transition, but I don't. Um, but it, it always felt a little frou-frou to me to say transition, right? So sure. passing works for me, right? <laughs> passing into death. So as a but, scientist. But even, right, right, exactly. <laughs> but even when you pass or, or a person passes, even if they only minimally contacted the world, the, the rest of us still have to deal with that. And yeah. and there's no, cl- like, like, I wish there was a word, like, like, I would, like, call it death works or... Mm. Yeah, or something like you you weren't involved with her getting sick but when somebody passes you have to clean up the pieces and there's no right. word in the US for being like hey I am picking up the pieces of somebody else's passing was it a good passing yes but you still and so right. so you sound so like prima donna being like oh I'm going through all my parents stuff if I could just say you know I'm going through mortha works or whatever the word was people right. would be like right. oh I get it you're picking up the pieces right yes. wouldn't that and yes. everybody would kind of collectively and it would also be an easy way to communicate like mm-hmm. if we all kind of understood the word for for I am Absolutely. picking up the pieces after somebody's death. Yeah, which other languages have those words. So it's so fascinating because too bad we're not German. We just can't cram right. like twelve <laughs> words, twelve words together exactly. and make it like right or just in Northern European. Like okay, so, I'm in the melancholy process of picking up all the afterlife of my dad's passing. You know, you're right. like, wow, okay. And what word is that? And that's like a five syllable word. Well, so in anticipation of this conversation, I was at uh, I was at a bookstore and looking through, and it jumped out at me. And the book is called the sweet the gentle art of Swedish death cleaning and there is a word in Swedish that means death cleaning and I would totally butcher it if I tried to pronounce it so I w- won't or yes I will because I, I can't help myself like dostadning and where do is death or duh is death and standing is cleaning and I, anyone who listens to this who actually speaks a don't at him. <laughs> Just don't, 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 don't at me. Stay out of my mentions, bro. Um, no, but uh, uh, please do inform me. But uh, 
that is a word in that language. Yeah. And so it and what's fascinating and the Japanese is Japanese have a word too. And isn't that so interesting? So, okay, before we go totally, it's not really off the rails, but I know (laughs) us, and we're going to end up having a wide-branching, fantastic conversation, but probably won't be able to go into podcast length. Um, You already touched on this, but I think it would be valuable to kind of circle around back to it is this idea of the emotional experience of caring for the dying and the emotional experience of the loss itself because as i mentioned there's a a, there's a fear of mortality that's baked into the experience right there's um a loss of perceived control yep there's the difficulty potentially of the dying process in itself, depending on the, right. the nature of the disease or the degeneration. Um, and as you also mentioned, there is a lifetime's worth of baggage. I literal was, and figurative. Literal and figurative. All of the possessions of the person, then also the emotional baggage you have of traveling with this companion, right. this travel companion. Where, either know. the companion that you looked out the window with and had a great time, or the companion you were like, just go. Like, either way, they sat in the seat next <laughs> to you. you know? throttle you today? Is that, exactly. that going to exactly. be okay? So now you're at the end, you're at, you're, you know that this journey is coming to a close, and suddenly all of this stuff is the right. force. So what, what was that experience like for you? Um, uh, clearly charged. Clearly well charged. Um, so one of the things that was interesting to me as as an anatomist is I I spent hours and hours and hours around dead bodies, right? And one of the things that I think that uh, is important to understand is that every, there are a few what I would call, um, how do I say, universal universal fears or universal uncomforts, I, I don't know, and they, sure. everybody has them, um, fear of being eaten. There is not a there is not a mammal or animal on the planet that's not like wow man that's really uncomfortable like more so than just like oh passing away like being eaten is a whole different uh, fear of heights right right, right. there uh, being mauled b- drowning right drowning. suffocation right yes, like all yeah. these biological you know and and but then there are cultures or people or just individuals that don't seem to have that <laughs> that part of them. I won't call it broken because I call it a gift, but they are not, <laughs> my wife might say differently, but, but they're not. And I just tend to not have this problem with dead bodies or death. And it's, and, and from the moment I was in graduate school and I went into a cadaver lab and I, and I saw everybody else's reaction to this, like <gasps> there was just really, and seeing everybody, some people, most people would just like put their emotional armor on and just go through and do yep. the cuts and because they, they knew this was a process and people in the past and people in the future will do this and yeah. there's a benefit. I was just like, this is cool. I don't get, I don't get like, mm-hmm. I'm not grokking why you guys are having a problem. I mean, I get it from a, because I'm not a psychopath. I get, like, emotive, like I understand, but I didn't get it. On the other hand, there are people who do, like, high steel work, right, in buildings. Like, I would be terrified. And yet yeah. these guys and gals, you know, walk across these beams, and, and you ask them, Are, did you train yourself? And most of them will say, it just, it's, it's not innate. something, it's innate, it's not something that bothers me, right? Yeah. And I think that everybody has a scale, and my scale happens to be really low, and so my perspective about being around dead bodies and the, the like isn't particularly bothersome. But you were asking, so it made me think, because I got to sit in a cold room with like 30 or 40 dead bodies by myself for hours on end, because anatomy, when you're not teaching a class, is very lonely work, because nobody just stops by to say, hey, dude, how's how's it going? You know (laughs) what I mean? So you sit, and you get to think about this, and I realized, for me, and I speak for no one else, that what you're talking about, the, the emotion about it, is that death is not most people when they really think about it don't fear the pain of death Hmm. and they don't necessarily fear the actual act of transition what they fear is the loss of self right yeah right yeah that's funny i wrote that in a note to myself (laughs) right and it's the loss of self that people worry about and and i had this um I, i had a close friend that i had this conversation with where i said to him uh we both had read ray kurzweil's book um uh, the singularity is near, mm-hmm. right? Where the intention is that we will become uh, next human, metahuman, you know, post human, right. right? And that that will be either biological genetic manipulation to the point where we live forever, 
or technological. or technological integration, machine human interface, right? right? And and both of us were like, we got to get off this place. We got to get out of this place, right? Like right. this place being either the Earth specifically or whatever. And then I posed a question to him, and I said, "You want to get out of this place? You want to go somewhere? Whether it is a different sense of reality on this Earth, so that you're not as threatened by the horrible changes that happen, or?" You, we literally launch you out in the stars. And I say, between getting off this planet and losing yourself, which would you prefer? What if I had to, you had to become a collective? Or your sense of what made you you? Because what if, what if we rephrase that death? Yes. Right? Just as soon as you said right? that. Right? Because like, yes. you're like, it is, the la- it, is, it is the loss of self that terrifies us. Yeah. Really, right? Yeah. Like, like, you think of losing an arm, you're like, God. But, but part of that trauma, I mean, and I, don't, I have never lost a limb, so I don't mean to project. Mm. But, but I imagine just your whole identity, you know. But I do know women who have gone through mastectomy is very close to me. And that change in identity yeah. of of who I am is this and I am changing and that loss of myself and that sense of loss. Mm -hmm. And so really fear of death is a pre-morning of my loss of myself. Right. And, and so what I realized was, and I will, I am Episcopalian to my end, but there are some sort of Eastern and Zen things about, Hey, giving up myself, giving peace. And I realized that is probably the best way for me personally to prepare for death. Is, to, is not to worry about how it goes or this or that, but to take away the fear of death is to start today maybe getting rid of all that baggage of, of being me. Like, do I have to be me? Like, what do I have? Right? Wow. And, and... <laughs> Jumping ahead, man. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. I did that specifically to screw with you, Ryan. <laughs> you did, did you it. You succeeded. <laughs> and so I, I, I think to myself... Um, uh, Wow, how will I prepare for death? How will I prepare my children? Because, you know, being Episcopalian, we believe in salvation and we believe in an afterlife. Or should I say, I am hopefully optimistic about the afterlife, right? <laughs> Says the but, scientist. Right, exactly, exactly. Uh, but, you can't help yourself. <laughs> exactly. But, but, but I also need to communicate this to my children. And it's been helpful to frame it in a loss of self or a change of self, like pop mm-hmm. up is no longer here and I won't even well and there are ashes that we have and what we're going to do with those ashes and spread them with my children and I've already spread some of them personally mm-hmm. yeah but but like pop pop has changed he is not don't expect and this has been really helpful and relevant re- relevant to my mother's dementia mm. so my I can explain sort of my to my children mom my, my mom grandma is changing she's not going to be she will still be grandma but she's her reactions and the way she perceives things is going to change. We should ex- we we should understand that. And my my, my four year old and my seven year old are like, dude, I get it, cool. And even today, driving here, I was like, you understand, Grandma has some memory problems. She's like, yeah, you talk about it all the time, Dad. And I was like, <laughs> okay, okay, you know, I'm good, Dad. This is your problem. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, right. So I I feel like I feel like if anything. My, my children were took on the emotion and upset, but there was no logical disconcordance that they felt like I felt. Mm. So when you were talking about all the stuff and the preparing, for yeah. me, it was getting, getting rid of that sense of um, self as opposed to vainly trying or hoping for an afterlife, and I don't mean vainly, I mean I truly believe there is an afterlife, but like Mm. spending my time placing my faith in that to give me comfort, okay, but what if I'm just earlier on in life get comfortable with not being me anymore? Like like being okay with me, the identity of Chris being something different. I think that, that, and, and I've started to do that, and the more I think about that, the less death, the actual act, not being dead, but, but losing self goes away. And here's a little preview of what's coming up next week. To that end, one of the things that we did do, and this is one of the few small, and I say that we don't have enough around getting somebody ready for death or family ready for death and how to manage it afterwards, but 
But one of the things we did do is uh, Extreme Unction for my father. And and for those of you who don't know, it's no longer called Extreme Unction. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's, called, <laughs> it's called uh, Anointing of the Sick. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. so from anointing, a Catholic perspective. Right, right, which is one component of last rites, right? So right. Anointing of the Sick, you also have confession, which is an Episcopalian. I don't need to confess to anybody. I need to confess with God, right? Right, but, right, but, right. But you also have confession, you have Extreme Unction or uh, Anointing of the Sick, and then right. you usually have the Eucharist. Right, the, right, the breaking of the bread, right, but I'm and all those things are what they are. I'm only going to focus on the the last the the unction, unction. right, uh, which is the term they they changed it like in, around the 70s after Vatican II. So, so <laughs> whatever that's what my family calls it still, um, and that that component seemed to give a lot of people peace. Like the show? Consider subscribing through my Patreon at patreon.com slash lifecoachingwithryan. You'll get early access to shows and potentially a host of other rewards. Want more? You can also find me streaming on Twitch at twitch.tv slash lifecoachingwithryan, where I play some games and I continue the conversation. I'm pretty active on Instagram. You can find me at instagram.com slash educate for the number four underscore life. That's where I do my book club. I record the book club episodes live on Mondays, and then I post them to IGTV. Later, I post them on YouTube. See you next time.